Hello and welcome to today's WorkSafe Month webinar, Respirator Fit Testing, Why and How. I'm Stephanie Murawski from WorkSafe Tasmania and I will be your moderator. Before we start, please take a moment to read the following slide about information received today. I'll now go over housekeeping. Here is a screenshot of the attendee control panel. You should see something that looks like this on the right hand of your screen. You're likely listening in using your computer speaker system by default. If you would prefer to listen over the phone, just select telephone in the audio pane and the dial-in information will be displayed. Webcams and audience microphones will not be used in today's presentation. Questions will be taken throughout the webinar. Please use the questions pane on your control panel to type and submit your questions. Attendee handouts are now also available for download via your handouts pane. Finally, today's webinar is being recorded. I would now like to introduce your presenter, Mark Reggers, Occupational Hygienist, Senior Application Engineer from 3M. Mark is an occupational hygienist whose current role at 3M Australia in the Personal Safety Division focuses on providing technical end user guidance and advice around the selection, use and maintenance of personal protective equipment. This is backed through his ex previous experience as an occupational hygiene property risk consultant, Masters in Science Occupational Hygiene Practice, Cert 4 in oh &S, New South Wales NSW licensed asbestos assessor and 18 years in the safety equipment and training industry. Welcome Mark. Welcome Mark. Hello, Mark, can you hear me? Oh, I can hear you now. Yeah, my, my phone just dropped out. Apologies for that. <laughs> Absolutely. I'm, I'm, I'm well, back good. now, all good. <laughs> all right, I'm ready to take over. Absolutely. Fantastic. Well, uh, thank you everyone for um, attending this morning and, and your time to, uh, to to log on in. Um, seems to be a regular occurrence in the current climate of, uh, yeah, logging into webinars and, and training and information sessions. So today's, uh, I guess, still fairly brief, albeit we're trying to stick to that 45 minutes to an hour time frame to give you an overview around respirator fit testing. You know, why? Why is it important? Uh, why does it need to be done? Why is it required as far as, you know, confidence in achieving protection on the job? And how? So looking at some of the different methodologies, skills and competences that fit testers should, should have, um, as well as thinking about as far as your workplace goes going down this path, whether it's you've got to do something in-house or you're engaging a service provider, some of those considerations around the edges there. So hopefully uh, you do get something um, out of today you will find useful. Um, but please, like I said, for a short time, I'm happy to take questions during today or whether we have an offline chat um, after the, the, the webinar. So I guess I just wanted to start off uh, today looking at, I guess from a high level view of types of respirators, because there's lots and lots of different ones that are out there that you're probably using in your workplaces or familiar with. Um, so this is sort of a, a really good starting point to think about fit testing and whether fit testing may even be required depending on what you're using. So this first sort of category we've got is what we call air purifying respirators in the negative pressure category. So air purifying really simply meaning we've got a filter or a filter medium that's capturing the contaminants from the air um, as it passes through and the wearer is breathing clean air in that regard. A negative pressure, so when the wearer is wearing it and using it and breathing it and working hard, it is actually a negative pressure inside the respirator. So it's putting that inward, uh, you know, sucking, I guess, pressure on the seals of the respirator, um, not just uh, you know, when you stand there not working, as you're breathing and working hard, that's putting that, that those seals under pressure there and wanting to draw air through. Then we have our powered air purifying respirators or PAPRs or PAPRs as you may be familiar or heard of that term before. Um, this is what we call uh, a positive pressure but works on the same principle in that we do have a blower and a fan that's sucking the air through 
the filter and then pushing that air up into the head top. So it still works on the same principle of using a filter, but inside the respirator, we've got that positive pressure and the air is pushing out on the seals. In the next slide, I'll just show a picture to, to visualize that for you. Then we go on the other side or category, what we call supplied air <clears throat> respirators. These are all positive pressure. Where supplied air, they're coming from a compressor or maybe a cylinder, an airline source. So it's not using a filter, but providing external air to the wearer to breathe in whatever environment task that they're having to do. Um, and then you've got our self-contained breathing apparatus that we're probably all familiar with from, you know, emergency services, firefighters, most commonly people are aware of, they're running into a building or a situation, they don't know what the hazard is, they don't know what the hazard levels are, um, you think about smoke um, as well. So these are all, I guess, the broad categories of respirators. So when we talk about respirator fit testing, what we're really concerned about is the face piece um, of the respirator, what is touching. So whether it's negative pressure, positive pressure, supplied air, breathing apparatus, if it is still a tight fitting respirator, that's relying on that seal to be maintained, they require fit testing. And we'll, I'll reinforce that a couple of times with other ways. So if you're in your workplace or dealing with um, industries and they're wearing those types of respirators, fit testing certainly is going to be required. So this next slide here just shows about that positive pressure for those that may not be familiar with the concept of these types of products where the PAPR there is sort of filtering out the air and is blowing a positive pressure, which is putting that outward pressure on the seals there. Um, as well. So it still needs to be close to the face for these loose fitting head tops, but it's not ultimately, it's not about that seal that uh, we're relying on um, as, as well because that air is pushing out. So oh, there's some, just some examples that we showed before, sorry. So broadly speaking, the Australian standard and most respiratory protection standards around the world categorise these different types of products into different classes based on their protection factor or their assigned protection factor. And very simply, what a protection factor is, is, is a number, I guess the ratio of reduction from outside the respirator to what's getting inside the respirator. Now, how that's getting inside the respirator kind of doesn't really matter because if it's getting in, it's getting in and the wearer is going to be able to breathe that in. So if you're wearing a respirator and you've got a really high concentration outside the respirator and we're getting a high concentration inside the respirator, well, the question would be asked, well, what is the respirator actually doing? The objective is to reduce exposure. Sometimes there's a bit of a, not a misconception that people, you know, lock in their head that respirators eliminate exposure. They don't eliminate exposure, they reduce exposure. And when correctly selected and worn based on the environment, that exposure level is incredibly low and not expected to cause health or harm in that regard. So using some simple numbers here, is calculating a protection factor, is if we had 20 furry particles floating outside the mask and two are getting inside the mask, we're gonna go 20 divided by two, gives us 10, so there's a 10 times reduction in exposure from outside the respirator to inside the respirator. Now usually you're talking, you know, milligrams per cubic meter for dust or, you know, PPM, but that same principle works across all of those. You know, we want to reduce that level from outside to inside, what the person or the wearer is going to breathe in. So this next little poster here, um, I sort of categorized um, from the Australian standards point of view, how they categorize these respirators. So if you can see here, this is uh, 1715 refers to as required minimum protection factor, or other standards refer to as the assigned protection factor. So these types of products and these little, um, I guess information here comes straight out of the Australian standard, that these products at a minimum are expected to provide at least a 10 times reduction in exposure from outside the respirator to inside the respirator. Um, and as we go up, these different types and combinations of respirators uh, are given a higher number. So if you look on the side here, um, increasing protection factor. So just this, this black line down the bottom here is the workplace exposure limit, whatever it is, whatever the contaminant. And just say we're working in an environment that is three times over the exposure standard. So if we had a line you know, going through there, any of the respirators in this sort of box here that has an RM, RMPF of 10, it would be suitable to use in that environment. If you say you were working in an environment that was 30 times over the exposure standard, well, something that has an RMPF of 10 would not be suitable because that minimum reduction that we're expecting would not be enough to bring it down underneath the workplace exposure standard or limit. Um, so in principle, that's how these respirators um, are sort of categorized. So obviously the higher the assigned protection factor, the more suitable they're gonna be for environments that have a, a high level or a very toxic level, or you, know, you start talking about self-contained breathing apparatus in ideal H environments. And one thing I wanted to point out here that I think sometimes gets, I guess people 
have, have a limited bit of knowledge, we'll look at the, the filtration and, and quite often this will apply to a P3 and say, hey, I'm using a P3 filter, that's the highest particulate fil filtration uh, efficiency, so that must be the highest one. But if you look here, I've got a P3 in the 10 section, I've got a P3 in the 50 section, a P3 up to 100, and a P3 in the 100 plus. So these protection factors are based on the combination of the whole entire product, not just the filtration. So sometimes that people can sort of see the P3, think it's gotta be the highest, but it depends what it's connected to. Is it a half phase? Is it negative pressure, full phase, positive pressure? So when you're looking at these different combinations, that's what they're factoring in. Now, different Australian stand, sorry, different standards around the world do apply different numbers. So the numbers I'm talking about there does relate specifically to uh, the Australian standards. Um, if you delve a bit deeper, different countries have different numbers, as I said, and happy to have a very in-depth chat if that's an, an interest, uh, interest area that you've uh, got there. So we are sort of zoning in on fit testing today, but I just really wanted to highlight that fit testing is only one part of a respiratory protection program. If as a workplace you were zoning in, you've heard fit testing is all the rage at the moment, and you're only doing fit testing, you're missing the point of the whole objective. So 1715 is a really good starting point to sort of give you that information or considerations for an RPP, Respiratory Protection Program. Someone's got to own the program, take ownership like any system. You know, we need to select the products based on the hazard, the contaminants, the wear of factors, a lot there. Obviously the medical screening of the users of the respirators, you know, putting any respirator on anybody is going to have a physiological load depending on that person's condition, health, environment, what they're doing, work rate, that's gonna have an impact. So they're questions we wanna ask before we maybe put someone in a confined space with an SCBA set that may be claustrophobic, or maybe they have a pre-existing lung condition. So it doesn't have to be super in depth, but obviously depending on what you're doing and the type of um, RPE you're using, that will guide you down certain paths. As we know, wearers need to be trained um, with how to use RPE or PPE or any type of equipment, and that obviously needs to be issued to them. Um, fitting of the equipment, which is obviously what we're really zoning in today. Obviously the wearing of the RPE, how to maintain it, how to dispose of it, the record keeping, the program evaluation, there's lots of elements there. But fit testing is a really critical element when the rubber hits the road, so to speak, in that we can select a respirator, it can be the right filter, the right type, the wearers are happy of it, but if it can't fit an individual, you know, well, that protection, well, the expected protection is not gonna be there. So it really is a check that ultimately, if they're wearing a tight fitting respirator, that they can achieve a seal, which provide confidence, providing they do the right things on the job and wear it correctly on the job, um, that they're gonna get that protection there. So I just really wanna highlight, we're really zoning on the fit testing, which is only one element of a respiratory protection program. Um, for those in the healthcare industry and um, the audience there, uh, US have a lot of really good, you know, respiratory protection program resources for the healthcare um, sector. Um, so there is like global information that will help fill in the gaps, so to speak, um, to consider for your world of things. Now, when we talk about tight fitting respirator performance, I was speaking about the filters there, but filtration is only one key element or one part of the equation to achieving protection. So the three key things I want you to think about about your workers um, who are wearing respirators and tight fitting respirators on the job or people you know, or maybe yourself. So number one, compliance, wear time. I know it seems pretty obvious uh, that it needs to be worn, but I know in my travels and maybe yours as well, you've been to workplaces and you've seen workers where they've got the right respirator, it's been, you know, maybe they've been fit tested, but it's sitting on the bench, not being worn. So clearly it's not gonna be uh, doing anything if it's not actually being worn. And when wear time, obviously wearing it 100% of the time that that hazard is present to protect the wearer. You know, if you're only gonna wear it 50% of the time, it's still gonna be a significant exposure there, um, which is what we're trying to avoid. Filtration, um, as we've alluded to, there's particulate filters and gas and vapor filters, so that needs to be correct for the hazard um, that we're, we're wanting to protect our workers from. So if it's not the right filter, just say we want to you know, protect our, wor our workers from gas vapor, we put a particulate filter on, clearly the gas and vapor is gonna go straight through that and the wearer is still going to breathe that stuff in, which is not what we want. And the third one, which is probably the biggest variables that we're really honing in on today, is the fit. So we can have the right filtration, the wearer can be wearing it, but if that fit is not correct or not worn correctly, obviously that contaminant is gonna take the path of least resistance, which is gonna be around the respirator seal or around the filter. So that's, I was gonna say it's the hardest part, but that's where we've got the biggest variable, which is what we're gonna talk about today and why fit testing and the appropriate questions um, to ask yourself as a workplace to, uh, to narrow that in and, and be confident that people are going to be protected. 
So I want to use this gentleman here as an example. Um, you may have seen this picture before. It's a, it's a picture I love to use in training. So it really does highlight those three elements that you do need all three to have confidence that protection is going to be there. So this was from a couple of years ago. It was floating around LinkedIn and I know um, many people in this space grabbed it and used it as a training session, but he's wearing it. So number one, tick, we've got one third of the equation there. Number two, is it the right filter? We're going to say yes, because the situation was an explosion. There was all that dust and debris flying, you know, traveling down the street. So tick two, we've got two out of the three things. But clearly, hopefully you've identified, and it's pretty obvious there, because I don't think you could more incorrectly fit a respirator, even if you tried to more incorrectly fit it. We've got a, a lot of issues here around fit. You know, So first big one there is it's on sideways. It's got that is, um, should be going around the crown of the head and around the neck, but they put it around their ears. And there's definitely respirators around the world and surgical masks that do go around the ears. So maybe this individual has seen that before. He's got it on sideways, as we said, so you can see the nose piece there. And this gentleman's got some a lovely, you know, sort of beard there. I'm sure it looks fantastic, but that's going to be an issue. But the gap between the the respirator seal and the in, in his face is quite significant. So, what is the level of protection that this individual is, is achieving? And it's not to have a go at this individual. Um, clearly, he hasn't been given the right information, training, instruction before being given this respirator to what to do. Now, I'm not saying fitting a respirator is hard. I mean, it is quite simple, but there are certain key things that need to be done that the wearer needs to be aware of to do to have confidence that protection is going to be achieved. I'm, I don't know about yourselves, but I've seen way too many pictures on social media from home renovators and the block and those types of shows where people have got the respirators on sideways and, and, up, and upside down. So we all don't know what we don't know. So hence why that training information is critical. But clearly, this person is going to be getting next to, to zero performance. So what does the Australian standard do, or how does an Australian standard identify good fit? I'm not sure if it's something that you've thought about. In very, I guess, simple terms, it would fulfill very basic health and safety requirements. There's a requirement in the Australian standard and many other international standards around the world called a total inward leakage test, TIL test. Um, and this is, is, if you're familiar with fit testing, um, essentially they get put in a chamber, they get put on a treadmill with a respirator, there's a monitor inside the respirator, and there's a monitor outside and sort of does that comparison to inside to outside the respirator, much like the CNC method we'll touch on today. But the Australian standard only requires that to be on 10 subjects. And those 10 subjects have to meet certain anthropomorphic, anthropomorphic uh, criteria, but still only 10. Think about, um, th think about your workforce or people you work with, you know, the diversity of the people, you know, the different um, you know, ethnic backgrounds and different characteristics of different people. Even if the Australian standard was fitting 10 people, 100 people, 200 people, it's never going to represent the wide variety of characteristics that all the potential people are wearers of respirators across the globe and just in Australia um, as well. So it's not a it's not a guarantee that something that from a respirator point of view that's past the Australian standard is going to fit an individual. So it's not an indicator. Now most respirators are going to fit a pretty good percentage. I know from a 3M point of view that we don't claim one respirator or one size or one style fits all. There's just too many combinations from that style of the respirator to the facial characteristics as well. So it really is a, a, a baseline check that it can meet some very basic criteria. But that's why the Australian standard talks about fit testing. And in many countries, it's a legislative requirement. So there's many, many, many things that factors are affecting fit, even if it's the right filtration and the person's wearing it. Um, so all tight fitting respirators rely on an effective face seal to provide the expected protection. Now, facial hair is, is, is a real big one. It's a challenge. I and mean, I've got a couple of good slides um, showing after this um, sort of some education stuff you'll find in some of the handouts with our white paper we've got there, some of these pictures. But facial hair is hard because it's a moving target. Different every single day. Myself as a male is going to be a little bit longer tomorrow, a little bit longer the day after. Every male has a different growth rate. I remember being in high school and having some, you know, some mates in year 12 that felt like they had a five o'clock shadow in high school. Um, so it's different for every individual male. Major dental work that affects the jawline as well. So, you know, the training, the fitting skill, what the wearer actually knows. These are huge factors of fit or not fit. Um, Australian standard talks about makeup, but what's that really talking about is the uh, respirator moving around on the wearer's face. I personally haven't come across that, but just trying to highlight maybe there is a female or maybe, you know, as a male, you're a female as well, putting a lot of sunscreen on and you're working outdoors. We're trying to reduce the likelihood of that respirator slipping and move, moving around. 
the design and maintenance of the respirator. I know from the 3M point of view, we've got lots of different styles and most there's many, many manufacturers that have many, many different styles as well, how well it's looked after. And the other real big one, which is a, is another challenge, especially for, for, for workplaces that have multiple pieces of PPE, that has a huge impact on fit. You know, it's not that you can't put a hard hat, uh, you know, disposable respirator, reusable, and with some earmuffs and some safety glasses and a face shield or different combinations. It's not that it's impossible to put that on there, but it's going to, all of that, how that's worn, how comfortable is it, how long is the person having to wear that, that's going to have an impact on the wearer and wanting to adjust the respirator or where they're going to wear the respirator. A very common one there is thinking about the respirator and safety glasses or maybe goggles where wearing the respirator correctly will, you know, the, the wearer, depending on their characteristics, the size of their nose, the length of their nose bridge, they have to wear it quite high, which won't actually cover their orbital area of their eyes. Or maybe they wear their respirator down a bit more, but fit their glasses on in the right location. Um, and quite often you, you'll hear, I know I certainly do, oh, you know, this respirator is not very good. It's fogging up my glasses. Well, ding, 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 ding. If, you know, if your glasses are fogging up, if stuff's getting out of the respirator, obviously stuff is able to get into the respirator as well. Um, from a medical point of view, I've got a little, you know, little bandage there. What we've been seeing, you know, to try and alleviate those pressure industries from long wear times, but they put those bandages around their nose and around their chin where that pressure is going to be. From a surgical mask point of view, not so much as an issue because it's not designed to be a tight-fitting product. But when we start talking about a respirator that is, needs to maintain an adequate seal around the face to maintain protection, provide protection, that's lifting the respirator off the wearer's face, which is not what we want. So little things depending on industries and characteristics, these are things to all be aware of that will impact on fit. So facial hair, this is a challenge. I know doing fit testing in my past, you know, people will turn out to be fit tested and they won't be clean shaven, which is absolutely a requirement. And you'll often hear the thing, or they'll say, oh, look, my, my beard or my stubble is helping to add with filtration. Uh, maybe if you're actually trying to filter actual bricks, um, but clearly this is not correct. Um, and obviously you can see there, that's one of my facial hairs. I went and did a little project a couple of years ago to get these kind of pictures to help with training materials. That's one big facial hair, um, 125 micron across, across, and there's a range of hazards when you think about aerosols and droplets and whether it's five micron or 10 micron or 20 micron, you know, that's gonna easily bypass that seal to move in between the facial hair when we're talking about hazards, let alone we start getting into the nanomaterials, one micron and smaller. Um, there's some studies there, I've referenced from the 1980s. So the concept of the impact of facial hair is not new, it's not unknown. It significantly reduces the expected level of protection. There'll be some level of seal, but it's not predictable and it's not reliable. So we need our wearers of tight fitting respirators to be clean shaved and have that confidence that seal is going to be achieved. Now, this is a quick little slide that we sort of sort of show sometimes for workplaces where, you know, it's about that facial hair between the sealing surface here and the respirator we're concerned about. So you look at a, this gentleman here with a lovely moustache um, on a full face respirator, that's going to be inside the sealing surface area of the seal, but wouldn't necessarily be on the inside for someone wearing a half face respirator. Uh, the reason we've got question marks here for the trimmed and full beard for loose fitting face piece is we still can't have facial hair or beard, depending on the length, being pushed out of the seal because that's going to allow more of that positive air to escape um, and is that going to be sufficient enough? So if you can sort of tuck your beard or facial hair up, so this hood or helmet down here, that has the seal sort of lower around the neck. So if you've got longer facial hair, you know, a beard and you can tuck that up, that's not going to be impacting that, that seal there and allowing more air to escape. So it's question marks, so it depends on the worker, the beard, the length, and some of those individual characteristics, but things to think about. So what respirator fits you? All wearers of tight fitting respirator, negative and positive pressure require fit testing. Now a common question that comes up is, well, if I'm wearing a positive pressure tight fitting respirator, like a couple of ones here on this half face, PAPR or SCBA, the reason why it's so critical is that you think back to those assigned protection factors, the required minimum protection factors, they were substantially higher than a disposable or the loose fitting head top ones. That is because those really high assigned protection factors are based on the positive pressure plus a seal being achieved as well. You know, those assigned protection factors are based on the wearers doing all the right things. It's not based on, hey, if I do half the right things, I will get 50% of the protection based on doing all the right things. 
it's not how it works. Also, from an SCBA point of view, you've only got a limited amount of air, so that's going to allow more air to escape. So there's other factors, and I know talking to different regulators over the years across the country, that's their expectations, and definitely will give out improvement notices or you know have chats with organisations who um, aren't shaved, even if they're wearing a tight-fitting positive pressure respirator. The ones that don't require fit testing, just reinforcing some stuff I mentioned earlier, is those loose fitting head tops, which require that positive air. Sort of, I think of it like a, a bubble being on a person's head. Um, obviously, we want a nice big bubble with a big bubble of air that the wearer can, can breathe in. Um, when you start getting into smaller positive pressure spaces, um, as far as you know, a half face respirator, full face, that bubble of air gets smaller. So there are impacts on that work rate that need to be considered as well. So I've spoken a lot about you know, the why fit testing or the importance of fit, we know that it's gonna be achieved. So what is a fit test? You know, very simply, a fit test is a method for checking that a tight fitting face piece matches the person's facial features and seals adequately to the wearer's face. But the process also helps identify face pieces or respirators that are not suitable. Just as much as we wanna know what is suitable, we wanna know what isn't suitable. Now there's a whole bunch of different methods that we're going to cover very briefly today um, about this um, to identify, to, to quantitatively or qualitatively uh, determine the adequacy of the fit. So the purpose of a fit test, as much as we know the why, is to find a respirator that adequately fits the wearer. I remember talking to a, a regulator um, last year um, off the back of the silicosis and the engineered bench type blitz that they were doing and most of the regulators around the, the country have done similar sort of uh, focuses where they had been to workplace, the wearer had been fit tested for the respirator they were wearing, but they had failed, but they had just continued to wear the respirator because they ticked the box of getting a fit test. So if someone doesn't pass a fit test, you need to then continue to fit test different other respirators until you find one that does adequately fit. So it's not a do a fit test, doesn't matter what the outcome is, continue on. So it's to find that fit test. As I was sort of alluded to already with the why of the fit testing, we are all different. Every face people on this webinar today, your workplace, there's gonna kind of be differences between all of us. You know, We want them to have that confidence that what is being issued to the wearer, that a fit can actually be achieved. Sometimes just the, the compatibility between the wearer and the respirator just may not be there because it just doesn't go together. And we wanna know that before we put a worker into a contaminated environment or a situation where they could be exposed to stuff that we don't want them to be exposed to. That's why you're wearing a respirator. It's part of the hierarchy controls as much as it's on the bottom, but that's still required for your situation. Fit is that confidence for respiratory protection. As I said, one respirator style, brand, size, it's not gonna fit every face equally the same. Um, and clearly from a compliance point of view, whether it's your own organised systems, but also from the workplace health and safety obligations that PPE um, is issued is, is of appropriate size, appropriate fit and appropriate comfort. So fit testing is a way and probably the most commonly accepted way when we talk about respirators to be able to demonstrate that has been met. So fit testing is required, you know, it's the first time they've worn a respirator or you've selected a respirator for an individual. We want to check whether it fits to them before they go and do the job. Maybe they're using brand X of a style and they've changed to brand Y because there's a, whatever the reason may be, we want to fit test that new one. We're changing the style. The wearer has a change of facial characteristics, um, whatever that may be. Maybe they've broken their nose playing football on the weekend or got a facial piercing as we'll you know, show on the next slide. Um, obviously individual companies may specify certain timeframes, um, but generally most organizations that I've dealt with sort of fall back on the annual recommendation based off the Australian standard, international standard, recommend that annual fit testing. Um, OSHA in the US a couple of years ago did a study looking at people with facial characteristics change over about a three year period. Um, and that's sort of why, that's sort of the supporting evidence that I usually provide to workplaces of, you know, why um, they sort of set this annually, because we change. Um, I know I'm not the, not the face shape that I was, uh, you know, five years ago and we all enjoy Christmas and different times of the year a bit too much than we should. That has an impact on, on our face and our shape. Sort of reinforcing there, that weight gain or loss, substantial dental work, you know, facial changes, or maybe you're introducing head-worn PPE for the first time and how that person wears the respirator or the location of where they wear it is gonna change as well. So really anything that is a new respirator or changes that may impact that seal, to the fit test, we want to repeat the fit test. And, and sometimes I talk to you know workplaces and workers, and they get so you know zoned in on thinking it's a test. I've got to pass the test at all at all costs. I've got to you know let me tighten the respirator as tight as I possibly can can test it. Um, 
the objective of the fit test is to replicate what is happening on the job because we're trying to be confident that they're being protected on the job. Surely, you know, most of us can probably tighten a lot of brands and sizes and styles so tight that, hey, yeah, we can achieve a seal to pass a fit test, but that's not actually how it's going to be worn on the job. That's what we're trying to repeat. We're trying not repeat, but trying to, um, you know, replicate the fit test to how it's going to be worn on the job. It's not about trying to pass the test at all costs, then go on the job and they wear it differently. Like, it defeats the whole purpose of what we're trying to achieve here or just be box ticking. This is about protecting the worker and the respirator that has been issued to them or planning to be issued can actually fit and seal. It's an important concept as well. Now, sometimes, you know, I know in, in, in the current climate, I know especially for healthcare, I know a lot of conversations I've had, maybe the concept of fit testing is, is new to them or maybe in the last couple of years. Um, but I've got a nice little video here from the 1930s, if you can pop that up there, um, Stephanie, um, of a fit test from the 1930s. So we can uh, play that. That'll be great. To make sure it would fit various kinds and sizes of faces, it had to form a dust-tight seal on all types. The long and narrow, the medium, the round and full. To test security of fit, coal dust was blown into the air. They breathe deeply, trying to suck in all the dust they can. When the respirators are removed, the sharp white line must show not a sign of leakage around the face piece. His face is dirty, but his lungs are clean. So that video is from nearly you know, nine, nine, 90 years ago. So I guess the, the concept of fit testing is not a new one as far as that seal is so critically important. Now, I'm very happy to confirm that that is not the current fit test methodologies we uh, we use today. Hopefully, uh, one of the, sort of, usually the, the most common comment is, uh, what about the guy who's actually doing spraying the coal dust in the wearer's face? What's his exposure? But like I said, the, the concept of fit test is certainly uh, not new. Now, I guess there's probably three main fit test methodologies um, that you probably most commonly going to find in Australia. There's a few other ones internationally that probably, you know, historically have been around, but I'm just going to really focus in on the three main ones that um, you may have come across in your travels if you're obviously you're here today because you're interested in fit testing. The first one here is qualitative, often, you know, shortened down to QLFT, um, aerosol taste test. And I'm going to show a video of each of these methods, so I'm not going to go too deep into how they work right now, and we'll, we'll talk about them. But just trying to highlight that there's pros and cons with each methodology, which we'll, we'll jump into as well. But this is a subjective test that relies on the wearer to indicate whether they can or can't taste uh, an aerosol solution um, being pumped into the uh, pumped into the hood there. Then we have two quantitative methods. Probably the most common and most well-known method in Australia would be the ambient aerosol condensation nuclear accounting method. Uh, probably the most common brand that people refer to is, is, is Port Account. There's also another um, one out there called AccuFit, but definitely Port Account would be the most common one out there. Um, this one is essentially a particle counter and is counting the particles in the immediate air, area um, outside the respirator in the, the area where the fit test is being undertaken and counts particles inside the respirator and does that ratio comparison reduction um, number to determine a fit factor. Then we have another method. Now it's probably definitely used in Australia, but not quite as common, is what is called a controlled negative pressure uh, fit test. Essentially what this uh, methodology is actually sort of sucks the air out of the respirator at uh, equivalent to what they, you know, a high work rate. So it's consistently, uh, you know, a high, you know, uh, really hard breathing in the respirator. And then it measures to see if that seal can be maintained. So if the seal can be maintained, that negative pressure is going to be held. If there is a, a leak or whatever amount, that negative pressure or that pressure is going to, going to, going to go back up um, there as well. So there's are the three main methods. So now I'm just going to go. We're going to. Uh, um, so for each of these methods, sorry, um, there's pros and cons which we'll, we'll talk about. Now, for each of the methods, there's different fit test exercises. Now, there's different protocols and probably not the time to, to delve into them, but there's different um, 
exercises for the different methods depending on the protocol that people have to do. And very, I guess, in, in simplistic terms, what we're trying to do with these different movements is simulate basic activities that a wearer would perform. You know, if we were to, someone were to pass a fit test and they're standing still like a statue, well, that's great, but I don't know many workers whose job it is to stand still and not move. The respirator, it's about maintaining a seal, settling back down on the wearer's face through a range of exercises, a range of breathing rates. So, you know, I think from, I think from an industrial point of view, you're probably climbing, crawling, physically moving in the healthcare point of view, you're up and down helping patients. You know, you're not standing still. Um, so there's different exercises. Um, um, this, what I've got here, the 60 seconds per exercise is a protocol from the international fit testing standard. Now, different protocols have different timings. Um, for those that are familiar with the more recent um, OSHA modified fast protocol, they have different timings per exercise. But just talking high level concept here, there are different exercises that under all the methods um, are required to be taken. So this first fill here goes for a couple of minutes is the aerosol taste test video. Um, so if we can uh, play that, Stephanie. So um, I'll just um, I'll put myself on mute here and just sort of go through, I guess, a bit longer, but the similar principles will apply um, to the other methods and we'll have shorter videos after that. So if you could uh, play that for us, Steph, that'd be great. The 3M fit test kits use a qualitative method to check that the wearer can achieve an adequate seal between a tight fitting face piece and their face. It relies on the respirator wearer's ability to detect the taste of a solution that is injected into a hood as a fine mist. The kits are suitable for testing disposable respirators and half face reusable respirators with particular or combination filters. The box contains a hood and collar, two nebulizers, two bottles of solution, spare nozzles, and user instructions. Replacement parts are available if any damage occurs or the solution runs out. Two versions of the test kit are available. 3M FT10 uses a sweet tasting solution and the 3M FT30 uses a bitter solution. The two kits allow a choice to be made and provide an alternative if someone is unable to taste one of the test solutions. The complete test breaks down into two parts, the sensitivity test, and the fit test. Firstly, unscrew the nebulizer labelled Sensitivity Test Solution and pour in approximately one teaspoonful of the Sensitivity Test Solution. Next, pour a similar amount of Fit Test Solution into the second nebulizer. With both caps removed, squeeze the bulb to check the nebulizers are producing a mist. Confirm that the test subject has had nothing to eat or drink except water and has not chewed gum during 15 minutes before the test. Fit the hood without a respirator fitted and arrange the hood so that there is a gap of approximately 15 centimeters between the front of the hood and the subject's face. Ask the subject to breathe through their mouth with their tongue slightly out and to indicate when they taste the solution. Place the sensitivity test nebulizer into the hole in the front of the hood. Squeeze the bulb to inject the test solution. Allow the bulb to inflate fully between squeezes. Count and take a note of the number of squeezes it takes for the wearer to taste the solution. If the wearer tastes the solution between 1 and 10 squeezes, then 10 squeezes of the fit test solution should be used at the start of the fit test. If between 11 and 20 are required, then 20 are used, and if between 21 and 30 are required, 30 squeezes are used. If the subject has not tasted the solution after 30 squeezes, then the alternative kit should be tried. The sensitivity test is important as it verifies that the solution is suitable for that person and establishes their taste threshold. Time should be allowed for the taste to clear from the wearer's mouth before starting the fit test. Rinsing with water may speed this up. The subject should also wipe their lips to remove any residual sensitivity solution. Explain the test and the seven exercises to be performed. The exercises are designed to simulate some of the stresses the face seal experiences during the working day. After confirming the taste is cleared, ask the subject to fit their respirator and perform a fit check. They should also wear any other personal protective equipment or glasses that will be used with the respirator and might affect with its fit. Ask the test subject to tell you if they taste the mist at any time 
instruct them to breathe through their mouth with their tongues slightly out and then fit the hood as before. Using the Fit Test Nebulizer, inject the Fit Test solution into the hood. Use the number of squeezes defined by the sensitivity test, i.e. 10, 20 or 30. The nebulizer must be held in an upright position to ensure correct misgeneration. For the first of the seven exercises, ask the subject to breathe normally and start a stopwatch or note the time on the second hand of your watch. There is a tendency for the mist to settle out of the hood. To maintain an adequate concentration of mist during the test, inject half the number of squeezes every 30 seconds for the duration of the fit test procedure, i.e. 5, 10 or 15 squeezes. After one minute of normal breathing, ask the subject to start deep breathing taking care not to hyperventilate and again remember to top up the concentration every 30 seconds. After one minute of deep breathing, ask the subject to start turning their head from side to side in slow deliberate movements, pausing slightly to inhale at each extreme. Again, top up the concentration every 30 seconds. After one minute of this exercise, ask the subject to switch to moving their head up and down, inhaling when the head is up. Continue to top up the concentration every 30 seconds. After one minute of moving their head up and down, and while still topping up the concentration every 30 seconds, hand the subject the passage of text in the user instructions and ask them to read it out loud. They should reread the passage for a full minute. After one minute of this exercise, ask the subject to bend at the waist, as if to touch their toes. Remember to top up the concentration every 30 seconds. Finally, ask the subject to carry out a minute of normal breathing. Remember to top up the concentration every 30 seconds. Once the subject has performed all of these exercises without tasting the mist, they have passed the test. You could at this point ask the subject to reach up inside the hood and break the seal of the respirator, followed by taking a breath. By tasting the solution, the subject will gain an appreciation of the protection provided by the respirator. If at any point during the test they indicated that they can taste the mist, stop the test and remove the hood. After allowing time for the taste to clear from their mouth, Repeat the sensitivity test. Have them refit and adjust their respirator and repeat the fit test. Two failures where you are confident there are no obvious fitting errors may indicate that the model of respirator being tested is unsuitable for that person's face shape and another size or model should be tried. After the test, a record should be created. Use the 3M record sheet available on our website or create your own. The nebulizers should be thoroughly rinsed out after use and wiped dry. If the nebulizer becomes blocked, it can be cleaned with the pin provided or the jet can be replaced. So that's the uh, aerosol taste test so that's a bit longer one the next two uh, are, mu are much much shorter but the similar principles apply as far as the exercises um, wanting to check they haven't eaten or smoken or something before the test and wanting to get people to breathe at those far extensions when they're doing the exercise especially for the CNC test um, yeah so if we can play the next video for the uh, CNC video there Steph So this video doesn't have any audio, so it's not your uh, computer's uh, audio having issues there. Um, but so this is just doing, I guess, a, a brief overview of the CNC. So you can see the, the gentleman came in with the, the facial hair, was asked to, to shave. So if you're fit testing um, in your organisation, I'd recommend having shaving cream and, and razors there for individuals to shave before they do the fit test. And there's going to be that instruction before the fit test and try and give them the information. You would have noticed on both videos that they're obviously donning other PPE that they would wear on the job to replicate the impacts of how they would wear it to maintain the protection. One of the really good things about the CNC machines, and I know I've used a port account many times, that little graph that you saw there 
was uh, what they call a real-time method. So as part of the training and before you start the fit test, you can sort of do a bit of a check to see um, how um, the individual is getting a fit. What you noticed there was the person stepping up on the actual platform there. So this particular organisation follows the UK protocol. Um, which is now the INDG 479. So part of that protocol, they also require the person being fit tested to add more phys physical movement, whether it's stepping on there on a cycle, you know, cycle bike or on a treadmill to try and increase that physiological load, the breathing rate uh, to replicate there. Similar exercises, the person's bending up and down, turning their head from side to side. You'll notice obviously this is an organisation that provides fit testing as a service. They've got plenty of options of masks. So you think about if that individual didn't pass on one style of mask, they've got other ones and sizes to actually try um, as well. It's probably the most predominant method that's out there, um, but very, very similar with the exercises. So the next quick video we're going to show here is the CNP method, the controlled negative pressure method. So this is very different um, to the other two exercises where there are um, movement activities, but um, the actual test is taken with the person being still. So we'll play this video now. So as you saw with, with, with that particular test, he had like a thing in his hand. So what it actually does is when he presses that button after he, so he holds his breath, presses that button and then sucks the air out of it. You may have noticed that um, there was actually no filters on the actual respirator that he was actually fit testing. So you don't have any filters because it's all about the seal when you're um, fit, fit testing. So as Mark, I said earlier on, yeah, sorry. Sorry, just, just just a couple of questions have come in. Um, would you like to answer them now or at the end? Yeah, yeah, fire away. Yeah, we're we'll just conscious of the okay. time. But yeah, we can get a couple of questions. Yep. Yeah. Okay, so can you please talk a bit more about women's facial hair with regards to obtaining a good seal? It's it's not something that I personally been asked about, but the same principle applies. If you know a, a woman who needs to wear a respirator and has I guess significant um, facial hair, it would be the, the, it's the same concept. Anything that's gonna break the seal, um, obviously what, what is considered to be signet will, a significant would definitely be a, uh, I guess a, a call by the fit test or the organization where it is, but this, the same principles apply with it, you know, anything being uh, interfering between the, the respirator seal and the wearer's face. All right, thanks. And can you just also clarify, um, is the PCBU responsible for fitting um, or is it the, the mask supplier? 
definitely the PCBU. So that's that's as a PCBU the duty of care of supplying any PPE uh, equipment. And obviously, a lot of the, the manufacturers across you know all the major brands will definitely provide help and training and support in that regard. But the ultimate responsibility is the PCBU, absolutely, or um, employer, depending on where you are in the country side. If you don't use the harmonised uh, terminology. Thanks, Mark. No worries. So as I said, this you know a few slides on. There's limitations and benefits to each methodology. Now the Australian standard, the international standard, doesn't say one's better than the other. But certainly, you know, part of you know obviously doing these kind of sessions is to make you know individuals aware who are looking after fit testing of what those pros and cons may be. Obviously, the big one with the, the qualitative, it's a subjective test. You're relying on the wearer to say yeah or nay. You can taste something. Um, you know, if someone feels their job relies on, you know, passing a fit test, they may be able to, you know, you taste something and tell you they can't. Um, I know I'm a, I'm a bit of a nasty fit tester where I like to only use the, the bitter um, solution because it's very hard to actually hide if you can actually taste that. The other big thing to be aware of with the qualitative, it, it's the longest test um, as far as the whole process. So you saw in that video there was the what we call the taste threshold screening process that that you know you've got to check that the person can actually taste it. If an individual just can't taste it for just that's just them, or maybe they've had an accident they just can't taste as well. well obviously that methodology is just not going to be suitable. So part of the test is confirming that the person can taste the solution within a certain amount of sprays, which they spoke about the 10, 20 and 30 sprays there. Then if then after the taste threshold screen, you need to go, usually wipe your mouth, have a drink, give it some time as well. If you fail a test, you need to go back and repeat the whole taste threshold screening. So that's why it's considered it most likely will take longer than some of the other methods. But some of the benefits from a cost point of view compared to buying some, you know, bit of machinery, it's substantially cheaper. Usually the four to 500 range-ish. Um, obviously no power required. So as far as on-field testing, you don't need any adapters to attach to the different respirators um, and test the filters and the respirator as a complete um, whole there. Well, some of the things with, you know, the CNP and the CNC, obviously we're talking about a machine. So there's a certain level of good knowledge to actually, you know, probe, attach the adapters, um, with the CNC method, you know, the port account method that people are familiar with, you need a certain level of ambient particle concentration in the immediate environment. A lot of time that's not an issue, but if you've ever been fit testing and it isn't, you're going to run your, be running your particle generator, you're probably going to be shaking curtains, kicking carpet to try and get your um, aerosol numbers up to a certain level and maintain that number. We want to maintain that number throughout the test as well. Um, I mean, with the with the port account CNC machines, it can test the full range of respirators from disposable, half face, full face, um, um, uh, as well versus the limitations on the qualitative. It can only do the half face and disposable. Reason being, the determined equivalent fit factor pass on a qualitative is 100, and usually we set our fit factor at least 10 times the assigned protection factor without getting too deep into that, which is why full faces aren't suitable or shouldn't be fit tested on a qualitative kit. Um, on the controlled negative pressure, um, you cannot fit test, you know, filtering face pieces or disposable or N95s as you may could refer to them. The whole mask is a filter, so it's not going to be able to maintain that negative pressure. So, um, you know, most commonly the, the CNC method is the predominant method because it can, you know, one machine can fit test the whole range um, of different respirators um, there as well. Um, so looking at the different styles of respirators that may or may not be suitable. So really, if you're looking at, you know, half face of disposables, you know, qualitative or the CNC, CNC quantitative is going to be suitable. Obviously, those filtering face pieces is not going to be suitable for controlled negative pressure. Um, for full faces, you certainly will be needing to go straight to, sorry, click one too far there, definitely need to be using a quantitative method. So a lot of time, I'll, you know, talk to workplaces, you know, what method should I go with? Well, first of all, what style of respirators do you have? If you're using full face, you kind of have to go one direction. Um, I know a lot of places they'll have, you know, majority will be half face and some full face for specific tasks. So they may use one method for one style and another for other. Like I said, it depends on what the actual situation is. Um, and for those sort of thinking about positive pressure respirators on, on PAPRs you know, on the healthcare, the, the clean space halo is obviously uh, one that's used quite extensively. During the fit test, it is conducted under negative pressure. So you'd be turning off the machine um, and you want to convert that into a negative pressure 
um, respirator. So it depends, there's criteria around that and you can use um, uh, surrogate ones, but, um, but definitely the fit test for those worn in positive pressure on the job, are fit tested in negative pressure. Now, the other key question that comes up all the time, well, who can conduct fit testing? The current Australian standard 1715 really doesn't provide any real guidance and detail. It has information about fit testing as a process, but that standard is gee, coming up to be 11 years old. There is the uh, standards committee work to adopt some of the ISO standards, but obviously that takes time. So usually what we're you know using in Australia to refer back to is, is sort of a good guidance piece is the international fit testing standard, ISO 16975-3, 2017, which goes through the details of what a competent fit tester should be able to demonstrate. And it's not about demonstrating, I know how to use the port Account. You know, it's about you know having a basic understanding of respiratory protection as a whole, um, understanding the limitations of the method, limitations of the respirators, how to use the machine, the diagnostic checks, the environment. It's more than just hey, I've read the instructions and I know how to press the button on on the machine or I know how to squeeze. You know, the, the fit testing process is really defined, really defined. But whoever's doing it. Now that could be an in-house person that is, a, you know, you send them off to some training and then build their experience and maybe you're engaging someone to come in and conduct the fit test. Whoever it is, they really need to, you know, you want to make sure that they're competent. So ultimately, you know, the fit test result is a reliable fit test result. So in Australia, we really haven't had, you know, hasn't really been great guidance in this space. Um, something that I'm you know, heavily involved with and, and, and been leading for the last two years is um, a program called RestFit which is a respirator fit testing training and accreditation program. You may have heard of it in your travels. Um, it's, <laughs> we're launching in December. We've been working on it for two, for two years, but what we're trying to do is we've developed a standardized training syllabus that different training providers have developed their course and map it against and we will sort of approve. Um, and then for go, having an actual accreditation process, which is essentially a, a competency check. So for those that go through that, that's their evidence of, of being deemed competent through a very specific process. So I do encourage you to go look at the RestFit website. Um, and I would put a lot of fantastic resources, FAQs, guidance materials um, up there. So that'll be definitely be changing the next sort of couple of months as we get to launching and providing more details when people complete the training and accreditation process. But really trying to you know set that benchmark. It's not legally required to be RESFIT accredited, but certainly we're, we're trying to make it easier for workplaces uh, to to find you know, consistent training courses or use fit testers that have had their competence demonstrated and, and measured through that there. So I really do rec um, encourage that. Now when it comes to fit testing, the actual fit test itself is, is probably the easiest part in the whole process, like many systems um, as well, in that is very prescribed, but it's all the logistics around the fit testing, which requires time and effort um, being implemented in, into any workplace. So who are your workers? Who are the people? Who are your high risk people that need fit testing? What products? You know, you may have selected a brand or style, you know, you're going to, you're very unlikely you're going to get 100% pass rate. So what are your alternative products? Um, alternative B, alternative C, what are they going to be? Whatever those alternatives are, are they available? Certainly healthcare, that is a challenge at the moment given the, the global pandemic, but the same principles apply in any workplace. You know, no point fit testing and passing a person on a style, but if that's not going to be made available through the store or where they access their PPE, what method are you going to use? Who is the fit tester? In-house, external person? Where are you going to do it? Um, there's different considerations for the type and size of room and ventilation requirements for each of the different methods where they do or don't um, apply. Um, scheduling people in, time off the job, time is money, who's going to cover their, their work, you know, what's the process if someone can't get a fit test, how do you manage the exceptions, the record keeping. Um, so there is quite quite a bit there, sorry, and obviously the repeat testing process as well. So all different considerations, it's going to be different for every workplace. Um, individual environments. Obviously, thinking about a hospital is going to be much more complex than to say a smaller organisation that has 10 people, as an example. So, this is where that respiratory protection program provides that framework to help consider some of these things through the process. Fit testing takes time. Um, you know, often when people talk about fit testing, they talk about oh, it's a seven-minute test or a two and a half-minute test. Thinking about that OSHA modified um, protocol, just want you to appreciate that that is the exercise time. You saw in the, the, the aerosol taste test video, there's a sensitivity test that's going to take time. The CNC and the CMP method, you've got to prepare the face piece, you know, the probing, different, that's going to take time. We're going to inform the wearer of the process, the fit test exercises. They need to demonstrate, you know, they can don and perform a, wheel, a wearer seal check. 
There's a specified five minute comfort assessment period, which is really something that I think um, hasn't been quite well known in there. So that is a five minute before you start the seven to eight minute exercise or the two and a half minute exercises. And the, and the purpose of that process is to let the mask settle you know, that they've breathed in and taken any aerosols out of the respirator. You think about the CNC method before there, it gives them time to see if it's comfortable. So that's a mandated five minutes before you even start the fit test exercises. Taking the face piece off, explanation of the results, maybe an additional training information to make sure they've done it. That's all if you pass the test. If you don't pass, or there's gonna be people are not gonna pass, well then you gotta repeat some parts of this particular process as well. So it takes time, so on average, 10 to 20 minutes depending on the protocol and, and obviously some tests will take more time as well so you know if you and this is hard because you're planning to have x amount of you know workers to be fit tested and you want to obviously time is money you want to get them through as quick as possible but if you're going to push people through and don't give it the appropriate time you're short changing them you're not allowing the process to do what is their design to do i've got a few more slides left i'm very conscious of the time so i'll, I'll make sure i fly through these um, the other question that comes through the back of this with fit testing, right, there's a lot of effort we've gone to, I've done all this stuff, um, but what is the actual real world benefits or real world impact that fit, fit testing will actually have? So this is one of my favourite graphs that I, I do like to show when, when talking about fit testing and the real world impact. So that the, the black line, uh, which got the arrow saying workers fit tested. So that's a whole bunch of data plotted from uh, 13 different studies done over many, many years in the, in, in the 80s and the 90s, where they were measuring on the job, real world workplace protection factor um, studies. So this is sort of the, the data that goes into to, um, support why a class of respirator is given an assigned protection factor. The other black dots is from four studies where workers were not fit tested. So this 10 with the red arrow going across, if you think back to uh, the assigned protection factors, required minimum protection factors, all these studies were done on reusable half face piece respirators, which have an assigned protection factor of 10. So what this is showing that all the dots above or the line above the red arrow is they were achieving at least a 10 times reduction or higher. So you think about the workers that were fit test, you've got some workers that are getting a 1000 times in reduction in exposure on average across the whole entire day, um, you know, of their exposure, 10,000 times, you know, getting close to maybe 50,000 times there. So it's not that when we look at that 10 number of an assigned protection factor that every person is only getting 10, that's the lowest number that we use because we don't know which worker is gonna be 10, 100, 1,000, 10,000. So that number is set for all, you know, work environments that, you know, so there's a statistical confidence when, the workplace does all the right things, clean shaven, fit tested and trained, that they will achieve that assigned protection factor or above. Versus the line for workers who were not fit tested, we had 55% of this group achieve the assigned protection factor or above. So it's not saying that if, you're not, if you don't do a fit test, you can't achieve an adequate seal, but clearly going through the process, identifying the ones that don't fit, the training process, gives the workers the information to know what to do and why to do it on the job. So, I mean, that's obviously from one specific, you know, a cohort or multiple studies there, but clearly that's a big difference from 98% achieving it and above versus 55%. So I know which camp I would rather be in, and that's the impact that fit testing has in the workplace when all the right things are going to, 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 to be there. Um, the other benefits that fit testing can bring, it brings, as I mentioned earlier about, you know, the respirator that is suitable, but also what is not suitable, you know, we're addressing comfort and PPE, you know, these respirators are all rated to protect, but if it's not comfortable for an individual, we know they're very likely to want to take it off, remove it, and protection is not going to be there on the job. And obviously that training opportunity is to reinforce, hey, this thing can achieve a fit, this is how it should feel. On the job, you know, if, you, if you're wearing it different and feels different, well, you're probably not going to be achieving a fit. Obviously, reinforcing they can be effective. Um, and, and this is all the stuff that competent fit testers bring to your respiratory protection program. Um, but it's, you know, so, so, so important that that rubber hits the road of the person knowing how to do all the right things. Um, the HSC, the UK has some really good um, guidance documents for implementing um, respiratory protection equipment programs um, in the workplace. Um, one of the things we saw in the aerosol taste test, and I really just want to highlight the difference here, is that um, there is a difference between a fit test, which is what we've been talking about, which is that annual requirement, versus a user seal check, that fit check that hopefully you're familiar with. So a fit test is that once a year or as required, depending on facial changes, but a user seal check is what the wearer um, 
needs to do every single time they put on the restivator. It's sort of a, a crude check off the back of the fit test that I'm, I'm going to be achieving a, a fit and I'm, I'm going to be achieving that protection or very likely to do that. Um, they're not the same. There are studies that have looked into that. It's not a comparison um, on the RestFit uh, website in the resources section. I've posted a whole bunch of different studies that look specifically at that. Look at that. Um, to I know in certain industries that sort of in the past been viewed as their equivalent. Um, they certainly um, are not. Um, I always view like a fit test is like uh, sizing up a shoe, but you still need to do up your laces every single time you uh, you put your shoe on to make sure. So. Similar, not exactly the same, but hopefully you can see what I'm going for there is obviously you need to drop your laces every single time and, and, and confirm that fit test there. Because someone can pass a fit test, but if they don't put it on their face correctly the next day on the job or whenever it is, they're still not going to be getting a protection. So a respirator fit test is not a guarantee that protection is going to be achieved, um, but it confirms that, hey, the wearer can achieve a fit and when they do the right things, absolutely that protection is expected to be there. So fit is a critical component in achieving protection. As I said, confirms a fit can be achieved, but still relies on the wearer to do the right things. It's just one part of a respiratory protection program, but a very important part. As I say, when the rubber hits the road to check that a seal can be achieved. If not, let's find one that it can be. You know, respirators can be really effective in protecting workers, but as hopefully I've highlighted and you've, you've probably, you know, your own experiences come to a similar conclusion. It relies on a lot of things to be in place and to be continuously in place and continuously be done to, um, to, to, to be there. Um, you know, it's got to be the right type, it needs to be fitted, it needs to be worn correctly every single time um, and worn every for the length of period that it is required. And, you know, we are talking PPE, we are talking respirators, it is the lowest on the hierarchy. But if it's still required, it's no less important than any one of the um, other controls. Ideally, we can control it with elimination, substitution, engineering, isolation, all those things that we know um, don't rely on behaviour, don't rely on the wearer, but we also know there's many situations where that is not possible and we are going to be relying on respirators maybe as a temporary measure or it's just a permanent measure because that is just the situation that people are working with and that's the environment. So no less important, if not, you could maybe counter argue then becomes the most important because it has the most immediate impact of a wearer being exposed to something or an event um, happening there. So I'm um, sorry I've gone a couple of minutes over but hopefully you've, uh, you've, you've, you've found that interesting and uh, hopefully we've got a little bit of time for any questions that may have come through. All right thanks Mark. So uh, yes if anyone does have any questions please uh, type your questions into your questions pane um, and submit them uh, for Mark to answer. Uh, Mark, can you uh, please discuss the use of tape at the bridge of the nose with N95 masks for people yep. wearing glasses? So um, I'm assuming when they mean tape un underneath the respirator from the, the picture that I had, um, if, if, if I've got that correct there, I mean anything that is going to lift, lift the respirator off the face is going to be a concern because that's going to be impacting the seal. Um, that there's there's some I mean there's different creams or barrier things that as long as they're not sitting on the surface can help reduce that it's not necessarily going to eliminate it um, I mean I know definitely in the healthcare world you know in more so in industrial you can stop take a break potentially take it off um, but obviously in, in different healthcare environments that is not going to be possible if you're in surgery you need to to keep that on um, so I'd, I'd be recommending against any of those tapes un, un, underneath um, the respirator because you saw that that facial hair that I had there and the size of that you think about the size of the particulates that were going to be you know or gases and vapors as an example in industrial environments that's going to bypass anything really really easily um, as far as the glasses go. Um, yeah, you want to you want to fit test with wearing those glasses or PPE um, on on the job. Um, I know I've seen some some different guidance out there saying you know if you if you put that tape on and you and you pass a fit test um, or you put it all around the seal. Look, I'm I I I probably don't necessarily agree with that because it's all about uh, repetition and repeatability. Um, of the fit test of what happens on the job. You know, so if someone's putting that tape on their face, how do you guarantee and ensure that that tape has been put on exactly the same every single time to represent what was in the fit test? So it's usually it's not recommended for that for that reason. Thanks, Mark. How about tapes used to hold masks next to the skin? Um, interesting question. I haven't been asked that one before. I mean, 
the, similar to my answer before, it's going to be that repeatability. So certainly putting tape on the outside to help hold it down, but the stickiness, the length, putting the tape on in the same surface area, how it sits would be would sort of be my my concern for the repeatability. I mean, if you can pass a fit test without it, and then you put tape on, I guess you probably are, you know, say that that's you know on top of that rather than if you're relying that in your fit test to put tape to hold it down on your face. Um, <laughs> How do you repeat that exactly the same on the job from that? You know, maybe you put it here as tape there with a certain coverage and not exactly the same the next time. You sort of get into quite quite a grey area there um, that I, I I personally would say just eliminate that and find a mask that doesn't require tape to maintain a fit because there's lots of styles um, out there from multiple manufacturers. Um, obviously, what you can get hands on is a challenge at the moment, but that's sort of where I'd sort of be encouraging if possible to go down that path. All right, thanks, Mark. And can you just conclude uh, by talking again about the the cost of of all three testing kits? Yeah, the the, the cost. Yeah, certainly. So the um, the qualitative kit, and there's a number of manufacturers, but you're going to be looking three, four, five hundred dollars, depending on the kit and manufacturing deal that you, you can you can get. That's definitely going to be the most affordable. Uh, the the, the port account or AccuFit machine. To, you know, they've got slight differences, but you're probably looking around the twenty to twenty-five thousand dollar mark for a CNC machine. Um, depending, they used to have ones that didn't have the N95 companion, but that's pretty much all built built into it. So that's the actual cost of the the machine. And then QuantaFit is sort of in that fifteen thousand to twenty thousand dollar range for if you fit testing reusables. So um, obviously, like anything that you're purchasing, that you know, if you can get a better deal because you're purchasing more. Um, that's um, certainly going to, from a cost point of view. Um, for the actual fit testing services, um, different organisations will sort of, you know, like a couple of places around the country, they will, it'll be like you, you book a man per person, you get charged a per person rate. Um, I know for a lot of on-site service providers are going out, they may, just based on time, so they, you know, eight hours, four hours, whatever it may be, they'll charge an hourly rate and will fit test. Because I know personally, I've gone and fit tested on sites in the past, and you know you're trying to make your time efficient to fit test as many people but the person you fit test has now got to go get billy or whoever susie who's down the other end of the factory or you know down the, you know did some fit testing some of the tunnel projects here in new south wales and that to go all the way down to an area to fit test so there's all those kind of considerations of the logistics but certainly for the, the quantitative methods there is more of a, a capital outlay um, but one of the the plus sides of the pro size is not subjective you're going to automatically, the machine's going to record all the data, it's going to create the certificates for you, you're going to use that database. So from a record keeping point of view, there's certainly going to be the benefits using an electronic device rather than most of the qualitative kits where it's going to be handwritten or you're going to type stuff up in Excel or have other types of, you know, more manual type entry per person. So um, definitely do your research um, and a lot of the time, like I said, I think the CNC method is the most predominant one out there purely because it can fit test everything from your disposable, you know, your half face, your full face um, versus the other ones do have limitations on what respirators can be fit tested with that method. All right, thank you, Mark. So thank you, Mark Reggers, Occupational Hygienist, Senior Application Engineer from 3M. And thank you everyone for attending today's webinar, Respirator Fit Testing, Why and How. Once you leave today's webinar, you will receive a survey on the presentation. We do appreciate you providing us uh, with your feedback. Today's webinar has also been recorded and will be made available on the WorkSafe Tasmania YouTube page. On behalf of WorkSafe Tasmania and the Work Cover Tasmania Board, thank you for joining us and thank you, Mark. Thanks everyone, have a great day.